Our gospel lesson for today comes from the Gospel of Luke, the 24th chapter, verses 13 through 35. Listen for what the Spirit is saying to the church. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And Jesus said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? Jesus asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were there with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, Jesus walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When Jesus was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem and they found the 11 and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning, we find ourselves transported back to Easter evening. The same day that the women found the stone rolled away in the early morning hours, the same day that the men in dazzling clothes said to those same women, why do you look for the living among the dead? The same day that those same women raced back to tell the disciples and the disciples didn't believe the women, the women's words seemed to them an idle tale. The same day Peter heard their little tale and went to see for himself and indeed found the linen cloths lying there, and so he went home dumbstruck and amazed. This is the evening we find ourselves in today. Don't you imagine that this was the longest day in the history of long days? I can't believe that Cleopas and his companion have decided to make the journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus, a seven-mile walk, on the same evening that all these things have happened, the same evening that their deep grief has mingled with the disbelief of this fantastic tale delivered by some women. We don't know why these two disciples are headed to Emmaus, but to Emmaus they are headed, 
and we are headed there with them. This walk to Emmaus is unremarkable in one sense. The Gospel of Luke is just full of journeys and long walks, and Jesus has spent his whole ministry in Luke's Gospel jumping from one venture on foot to the next. But this walk is remarkable in another sense, because Jesus is not here anymore. These disciples have lost their beloved friend and teacher, and they are living in what theologian Shelley Rambo calls that strange middle space of trauma, that deep Holy Saturday pit of grief. Many of us have been here, too, at this point on the Emmaus Walk. Not exactly, of course, but we too have visited the Holy Saturday space of grieving and tears and utter confusion. This is the very beginning of a walk, unlike any of the walks that have come before or after it. This is the walk you take in the wee hours of the morning when your spinning anxiety has you unable to sleep. This is the walk you take in the late night fog when the tears will not stop. This is the walk you take when you are confused or when you are alone or when you are disappointed. This is the Emmaus walk. Jesus is dead and some women have told a story but we are not so sure about the story and now there is just the walking and talking and walking and talking. And then a stranger appears on the road. This man sees them and they're walking and talking and he wants to know what they're talking about. They stop their walking now because how could this stranger not have heard what has happened in these past days? We have been here too at this point in the Emmaus walk. This is the place where we cannot possibly believe that there is anyone on the face of the earth we might encounter who is not in this pit of grief or confusion or anxiety with us, who has not heard of the events that have taken place to spin us into this place of walking and talking. So these disciples stop dead in their tracks and fill the stranger in. We're talking, they say, about Jesus of Nazareth, our friend and teacher and prophet, and about how our leaders condemned him to death and left him to die on a tree. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. But we had hoped. We have surely all been here at this point in the Emmaus walk. But we had hoped that the test would come back clear. But we had hoped that we'd get that promotion. But we had hoped that we'd get to have a prom this year, or graduation, or confirmation, which we should be celebrating today. But we had hoped that our community wouldn't be affected by this pandemic, that our family wouldn't be affected, that we would somehow find ourselves unaffected. But we had hoped. These two disciples on the Emmaus Road had hoped too, that this man, Jesus, whom they had loved to the very bitter end, would be the one to redeem Israel. And we hear the words they don't say, but I guess we were wrong. Then they tell this stranger about the very odd tale that these women have told them about how the body of their beloved one is supposedly not in the tomb anymore. We can almost taste their puzzlement and their sadness. What a strange few days. But this stranger on the Emmaus walk starts to join in on the walking and talking now. And his talking isn't quite like the disciples. He's interpreting scripture. He's telling all about how the Messiah, the longed for one, was always meant to suffer and die and enter into his glory. He's talking about Moses and the prophets and all the sacred texts the disciples have loved for so long. The stranger talks for a long time, 
the walking and talking is becoming tiresome and the sun is sinking deeper into the horizon. But this stranger has sparked something within the disciples. They are intrigued and he's starting to turn to walk in a different direction. He's giving them an out so that they don't have to keep up the walking and the talking with him. But they realize it's important somehow that he stay. Stay with us, the disciples say, for it is almost evening and the day is nearly over. And so the stranger does. The stranger stays and sits at table, takes bread, blesses it, breaks it, gives it to them. And it is in this very ordinary act, this everyday occurrence of eating bread at a table that these two disciples finally, finally recognize that it is their risen Lord, their friend, who is seated with them. This is no stranger. This is no random skilled conversationalist with a strange and remarkable knowledge of scripture. No, this is the longed for one the Messiah, the beloved teacher and friend. And in this moment of recognition, in this very ordinary task of sharing bread, the risen Lord vanishes. As quickly as he arrived on our Emmaus walk, he is gone. And these disciples are quick now to take a page out of the women's book. They spring up from their seats, tear out the door, and bound back to Jerusalem to tell everyone what has just happened. The Lord has risen indeed. Indeed. And this is the part of the Emmaus journey that we are invited into this Easter season this final scene that speeds by in a flash so quick you'll miss it if you blink. God invites us into the story of hospitality and recognition and witness, the story where all of a sudden stranger becomes host. We are invited into this moment where the disciples recognize their resurrected friend in the most mundane of places, in the breaking of ordinary bread. At the end of a long, hard, confusing day of walking and talking, it is not in the walking and talking, but in the eating that they see the risen Lord for who he is. This is what happens every time we gather around our communion table to receive the holy meal together. Stranger becomes host. And our eyes are opened in the breaking of the bread and the pouring of the cup. We are nourished in our very bodies by the one who breaks the bread within and among us. In this sacrament, we recognize Jesus. We come to know more of him, the generous host, the fulfillment of all our longings, the source and goal of all the gifts of our lives. At that table, Christ is made known to us in the breaking of the bread, and it is an enormous gift. But you're probably listening to me and thinking or saying out loud to somebody at your house, yeah, and it really stinks that we aren't able to gather at that table right now. Yeah. It is for some of us the single most disappointing reality of our being away from one another in body, during this strange season. I think and pray often for you who love the sacraments, especially our 830 worshipers who maybe have come to long for the bread of communion every single week and from whom that bread is now withheld. We just can't be church in the way that we're used to right now and that is hard. For some of you, it may not be the bread of communion you're longing for most, but the music of the Rejoice Band and the choir and the organ or the laughter in the children's ministry hallway or the hugs of greeting before church school. These are the places where the risen Christ is made known to us, where we have come to expect that the crucified and risen one will dwell, where we know that our eyes will be open time and time again and we will recognize Jesus. 
And it is right for us to expect that Christ will be there because he has promised that and Christ is faithful to his promises. But if we keep walking with the disciples on this Emmaus road, we come to find that Christ is also made known to us in the most ordinary of places. If we keep up our walking and talking, we find that after the walking and the talking, there is eating, and the eating becomes feasting. We might find that in the chaos of having the kids home from school, God bless you, parents of little ones, that God shows up in little moments of laughter and silliness at the end of a long day. We might find that in the solitude of life alone, God bless you too, folks who live by yourselves, God shows up in the silence of our own hearts. We might all find that in the uncertainty of this season, the mystery of God is made known to us more deeply. The resurrection sure didn't look how Jesus' community thought it might look. There was no triumph and fanfare, just a rolled away stone and some women and some angels with a strange message, a holy mystery. In this Easter season, we remember that when Jesus came back from the dead, he bore the wounds of his crucifixion. He did not rise in a glorious and beautiful and blemishless body. He rose with scars and wounds in his hands and side. We know this is true thanks to the lovely and vulnerable witness of Thomas in the Gospel of John. It's an incredible reminder that Jesus is alongside us in our Emmaus walk on this road of confusion and recognition and feeding and witness. The one who is the very bread of life is the same one who walks alongside us, bearing the marks of his own resilience and vulnerability. This is the Jesus who is made known to us this season as we journey apart from one another in body, but united in spirit and witness. And so as we continue to walk and talk as a community together but apart, may we recall that Christ walks alongside us in this journey. And he is made known to us in acts as ordinary as the breaking of bread. Blessings to each of you as you travel alongside one another and continue to be church, even in the strangest of times. After all, the disciples on the Emmaus Road were in the midst of strangest of times, too. And that's where the risen Christ showed up. Amen.